Hello, everyone. Welcome to Concordia University's fourth space, and thank you for joining us for today's event. Uh, Seed Root, an artist talk by Shelley Ball. To help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from fourth space, and we lo are located here on unceded indigenous lands in Chichague, Montreal. And at fourth space, we work with the university community to help mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities that examine research questions, projects, things in development here at the university. We're running this event as a live stream meeting. So anyone joining us there, feel free to ask questions via the chat. And for those of you in the space during the Q&A period, just let us know, we'll get a microphone to you so you can ask your questions that way. And with that, it's very much my pleasure to pass on for a little bit more context for today's event to Varda. Varda, thank you. Hello and welcome everyone. Um, it is my honor as the coordinator together as a working group due to the support of CISC, the Center for Interdisciplinary Studies in Society and Art at Concordia. The working group is a collective of researchers whose work intersects with the various geographical regions that make up the Global South. The intention uh, was and is to critically engage with this designation and unfold the many complexities and cultural specificities that make up the broad regions that fall under this rubric, both here and there. Taking an interdisciplinary approach, we will consider ways in which diasporic and transnational configurations disrupt geopolitical designation and explore various South-South implications for artistic practices and materiality, interregional coalitions and transnational solidarity activism, uh, something that we very much need uh, in today's context. We begin our critical exploration by focusing on South Asia and its multiple diasporas formed um, across lands and oceans. Our primary interest in this group um, was to connect with the Global South as both an abstraction and colonial post-colonial histories uh, without being essential, without essentializing them. And as will become the point of our discussion today, what is the impact of Global South discourses on the cultural production of racialized communities living and working in the Americas? Um, we also look forward to all of you joining us for our other events that we will be that will be happening. Uh, one is happening next month. Uh, there are some planned for winter. But for now, I hand over to Professor Balbir Singh. Thank you. Okay. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Varda, for um, the introduction to South South, which is a very exciting um, and ongoing working group. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing artist Shelley Ball. And um, I am just, yeah, very uh, pleased to be sitting with her and, and be in conversation with her following her talk in a bit. So Shelley Ball is an interdisciplinary artist and decolonizing art trailblazer. As an artist, educator, and curator, she has been leading and participating in BIPOC and feminist-run art, artist-run culture in Toronto and New York City for over 30 years. Ball is the child of refugees in, of India's partition, and her entire family was forced to flee Multan, Punjab at the end of the British Raj in 1947. She was born in Benaras, India in 1970, raised in a few Indian cities, and later Toronto, Canada. She's currently based in New York City. Ball received her BFA from York University in Toronto and her MA from New York University. Her interdisciplinary work in drawing painting, sculpture, installation, performance, photography, and video has appeared in many solo and group exhibitions in North America and internationally. Select group exhibitions include 12 Gates Gallery, Philadelphia, Ajay Gemo Gallery, Canada Council for the Arts in Ottawa, La Green Gallery in Mumbai, Field Projects New York, Botham Press Gallery in Vancouver, and her solo exhibitions include Lahore Museum, these are just selected ones, Gallery 400 at the University of Illinois in Chicago, Bronx River Art Center in New York, uh, Lee Kassing Gallery in Toronto. 
Her artwork has received significant critical attention, and she has been featured in the New York Times, Art Forum, Time Out Delhi, Now D Magazine, National Post, Hamilton Spectator, Asian Art News, World Sculpture News, Art India, Vancouver Sun, Art Asia Pacific, New Art Examiner, Fuse Music Magazine, and other publications. Shelley has also worked with numerous arts organizations as an educator, curator, and arts programmer. She is founding artist member of SAVAK, South Asian Visual Arts Center. Um, she is founding, uh, sorry, and Zen Mix 2000 Pan Asian Visual Arts Network in Toronto. She was the inaugural director of SAVAK from 1997 to 99. She has also served on the board of directors for the South Asian Women's Creative Collective in New York City and Mercer Union Gallery, a Space Gallery, and Savak in Toronto. She has received many visual artist, uh, arts production grants and fellowships for independent projects, artistic collaborations, and residencies, including support from the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute at the University of Toronto, Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts Council, and the Canada Council for the Arts. From 1999 to 2000, she was the first curator in residence for contemporary art at the Art Gallery of Ontario awarded through the Canada Council for the Arts Culturally Diverse Curators Program. She has participated in artist residencies at the Lahore Museum at Beacon House National University in Lahore, Pakistan, Center for Book Arts in New York, Brick in Brooklyn, Religar Arts Initiative in uh, Delhi, Artist Alliance in New York, Banff Center for the Arts, um, Mat Matukana 100 in Santiago, Chile, Vermont Studio Center, Sanskriti Kendra Foundation in Delhi, in spring 2023, she will. Uh, well, she was artist in residence at Rung in Vancouver. Finally, Ball has taught studio art, art theory, and art history at Saint Francis College, Brooklyn, Bard Micro College, University of Toronto, Ontario College of Art and Design, University, Alfred University, Pratt Institute, and Vermont College of Fine Arts, amongst others. So please um, join me in welcoming Shelley Ball. Thank you for that very long and beautiful intro. Appreciate it. So should I okay. just, uh, 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 <laughs> few tech issues here? Having a little bit of an echo. Let me try again. Okay, how is that? Very sci fi. Okay. Um, should I continue? Are there now? No. When is that coming? We did a test. We did. Yeah. It's, uh, Don't recall. Have a few minutes. Just running a test here. Is someone in the Zoom?
That, that should be okay now. Sorry, everybody. How is this? It's all good? Okay. Um, apologize about the delay. We'll get started. Um, the um, title of my talk is based on a recent sort of art project I've started called Seed to Root. And so I am today especially planning to be a lot more sort of personal in my presentation of my artwork than I usually am. Um, and I feel like it's perhaps this particular moment in my life and uh, you know journey as an artist. So what I'm gonna do is uh, start with what I sort of think of as my seeds. Uh, what are sort of the points at which I sort of began to think of myself as an artist and also be encouraged to think that way. Um, so I'm gonna go kind of really way back um, and let's start. Um, it's gonna be predominantly by presentation. Let's see if it's working. Folks, I think, uh, yeah, might need a little, there we go. Okay, so seed to root. Uh, this is an image from that recent body of work. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I have been, especially in this past year through serendipity as well as sort of intentionality, been really thinking about what does it mean to, to share, to meet, to um, storytell, similar to what I'm doing here with this group today. Um, and I feel like my entire process is of like being an artist, of being a human, of being part of family, and being parts of communities of artists has been about that kind of journey. And I know usually when we talk about um, an artist's career, it's generally fairly linear, you know, started here, mid-career, uh, the end of your life, uh, the last work you make, whereas I'm really interested in thinking in circles, and circles are really kind of an important motif for me, and so uh, as part of my circle, I'll be going backwards a lot, um, and to me, going backwards is also about constantly being in motion and moving forward. Um, okay, so here, I'm going to start by uh, this very personal uh, moment of honoring uh, my dear uncle who passed away this week, and he is one of my uh, greatest seeds. And so um, a quick story about him, again, as an individual, he's somebody who was innately curious, um, a man who was constantly, though he was an engineer by trade, had multiple degrees, had multiple interests. Um, at any moment's notice, he would break into song or recite or the poetry, et cetera. Uh, he's also, um, an interesting connection to me being here in Montreal today. Um, I just got this story as we were talking about his very sort of untimely tragic passing last week. My mother was like, yeah, when we came to Canada as immigrants, I was seven coming from India, we actually landed in Montreal. And he was the person who greeted us um, on this land, this very sacred ancient land. And then we um, came to Toronto, which is where kind of my my seed in Canada actually begins in Montreal, and I didn't know that. I had forgotten that. Um, and so this is sort of an addition to my particular uh, understanding of who I am as an artist, that he was the person. Um, I also uh, want to, for the first time, kind of uh, in an art talk, honor my mother. This is my mother, who is not an artist. Um, she was a teacher by training. But um, around the time I was born, she started to take a painting class. And being a big fan of Amrita Shergill, et cetera, it's amazing to see what my mother was able to pick up in moments. And I think of those as seeds as well um, in terms of my own practice. And um, moving on, I'm also uh, just sort of thinking of key moments. We all have those key moments where you feel like, Something in your life changes, something shifts, you begin to see things in different ways. Uh, this was a trip I took back to India with my family. And um, this was one of those few moments we weren't you know, with relatives. I don't come from a family that's artistic in sort of a traditional sense of an artistic family. But my parents chose to 
take me here, knowing of my own sort of creative interests. And my mother, especially, I think from childhood, had always said, uh, you have an artistic sensibility, you have artistic hands. And I think being in this space, not having any kind of cultural context for what this was, other than this is, this is our history, this is our culture, right? To go back into these spaces and uh, the, the prep, sort of very profound physical experience of being in this dark cave with a flashlight in your hand, uh, seeing just oftentimes moments. And I felt like it's those moments and not necessarily always understanding the full context, which has always, I think, been my experience as a diasporic South Asian uh, artist, is taking those moments, but somehow finding a way to weave a new story out of them, right? So uh, just wanted to kind of highlight these moments that have been fairly profound for me. And then we'll do a little switch when we think about this is our culture, this is our heritage. Uh, this is the other sort of very major influence right through childhood to today is the influence of pop culture, South Asian pop culture, and especially in the diaspora. And coming from a family that didn't have sort of traditional links to the arts, uh, everyone else is, uh, you know, engineering, medical school, et cetera. Those were the kinds of options that were presented to me. But at the same time, somehow these narratives, the imagery, the, you know, hand painted, um, you know, movie posters, et cetera, all of that kind of ephemera material visual culture has kind of made its way and uh, ends up being filtered into uh, the work I make. And so just wanted to highlight and also this, um, I think that it's important to highlight, I went to school, you know, art school, right from middle school, high school, college, I went to art school and this was my art school training, right? Right from that age, predominantly Eurocentric, uh, predominantly male, white male. Um, and so this is what I was consuming and this is what I was offered. Um, and yet I had all this other stuff that was brewing, but um, especially in, in art school at York University, I had to think about, you know, what, what am I gonna make? You know, what is the story I have to tell? And this is um, sort of a, an interesting and challenging dilemma because the, there were no other um, sort of models, mentors available to me. Um, I had no other um, artists of color as my faculty. I wasn't shown the work of women artists. I wasn't shown the work of uh, artists of color or you know artists from the global south. It was not available to me. Um, and so uh, there was always that kind of search and trying to uh, create sort of a new um, aesthetic, uh, create a new sort of language, create uh, new forms. And so uh, just highlighting some very, very early work. Um, and I think the key shift for me was when um, I began to finally, towards uh, the end of my undergraduate career, uh, find this community that I had kind of imagined and hoped for and never really uh, had any access to. And it was also important to point out that this type of community didn't really exist in Canada or the US in a significant way. There were individual artists, people were working, but that idea of community and how people come together, that wasn't um, something that just um, happened by accident. It was very, very intentional. And so I wanted to just sort of point out these, because for me, these are very, very seminal moments. And again, the point where everything, the world as you see it just kind of shifts. Uh, you begin to see potential, possibility, um, and uh, you begin to imagine sort of your own utopias, your own futures. And that's what a lot of us fortunately were able to do. And also at this time, um, it was the first moment for me sort of coming out of undergrad where you realize there's this world outside of school, what is it? And creating and building community at that time with other POC artists, um, other racialized artists within, uh, this was in Toronto. Um, and then I, I moved to New York a year later and uh, also in New York, even though um, I would actually say what was happening in terms of community building was far more active 
uh, in, in Toronto, especially within the South Asian community than it was in New York mm -hmm. of the time. Um, and so uh, this just allowed me again, when you begin to see things again in print and you begin to see that there's other people interested in what's happening. Um, and it's not just, you're not just speaking to yourself, the conversation begins to spread out, uh, outwards. Um, and so this was uh, some of the work from that uh, early exhibition I was making. And um, I'll just go fairly quickly also to give a sense of, uh, some of these slides are actually uh, made in collaboration with uh, Rachel Galpana James. We uh, did a presentation re uh, recently for uh, SAVAC, which is a South Asian Visual Arts Center formerly South Asian Visual Arts Collective, which uh, grew out of Desh Pradesh and that very first show in 1993. And it really was just a moment where, whether you were involved with activism or the arts, people really began to engage and say, well, we need to do more projects. We need to imagine uh, ways to continue this uh, incredible kind of uh, communal energy that was being built. Uh, so this is just, again, um, some idea of what was happening on the streets um, within uh, artist-run movements, artist-run communities. Um, and A Space Gallery was sort of, for me and for many, many others, sort of our home base, because none of the other sort of artist-run centers uh, at that particular moment were particularly welcoming uh, to us. And uh, A Space was our safe space. Um, so another similar to Desh Pradesh and Sabak in um, Toronto, uh, I became involved when I went to, to New York. I was there for grad school at NYU. I, again, was looking for that kind of community uh, because it was so, you know, uh, rich, exciting, and very um, also transcultural in Toronto. But that didn't really exist at the time in New York. But there was Godzilla, which was more of a Pan-Asian um, collective. Uh, and network, which was very, very activist based, very similar to Desh Pradesh. Uh, and I was thrilled as a young artist to um, see sort of a bit of the inner workings of how artists organize. Uh, and so, for example, Godzilla had done protests at the Whitney Museum, protesting uh, the, the biennial and the fact that there were no Asian artists or uh, other racialized artists uh, being exhibited. And uh, there were meetings with um, with uh, the, the curators at uh, the Whitney and uh, some curators from Godzilla also got hired uh, at uh, various museums, artists began to show. So this was this real push from artists pushing for change. And so to see them, and this was uh, most of the artists involved were let's say a generation older than me. Um, and to see how they were able to do that um, kind of inspired me when I, then came back to Toronto a couple of years later uh, with uh, SAVAC that was formed in Toronto out of Desh Pradesh and another collective Zen Mix 2000. Um, and just really inspired me to uh, create uh, a bit of a push in what was already sort of an established artist run culture in Toronto. Um, and so this is again more context for what was happening uh, at the time, and there were a number of uh, print journals, uh, and for me especially Fuse and Mix Magazine and Rung uh, were really sort of key to not only making the work, exhibiting the work, but um, you know writing about the work, contextualizing it, theorizing it, even critiquing the work, because one thing that we often find is that it's it's still very difficult to critique within a group, uh, but it's so important. And some of the examples of the writing there, um, you know, just went right in. Um, it was very critical, it was very focused, um, and uh, I think just very necessary. So all these archival materials exist, but even today, I think uh, it's interesting to note that even 30 years later, a lot of people don't know about these materials and uh, or don't uh, know how to access them. And a lot of them are not very well archived, um, but Rung has done an incredible job right now and all their past issues are available digitally. And I'm working with Rung as an artist in residence. And um, I believe that that kind of process of constantly looking forward, but looking back um, has been really, it's been really helpful to me. I think it's really uh, something I hope younger artists, researchers will also continue to use. And so this is uh, another collective.
prosthetic models on um, Godzilla in New York and uh, Asian uh, Canadian Artists Collective. But we exhibited artists from all over um, the Americas, I think, um, perhaps even some artists from South Asia, I'm trying to remember, but predominantly Canadian um, and Toronto based. Uh, but, you know, we were getting, you know, packages of slides from anybody who heard of, this is pre-internet, so people are just, you know, mailing packages of slides out and hoping somebody looks at them, responds. Um, we also uh, did projects right from uh, rented spaces, storefronts to the AGO Museum in, in Toronto. So uh, I think this is, again, an interesting point where also uh, there were certain funding shifts that began to happen where there was incentive for mainstream institutions to start to bring us in. Uh, but it also creates a very complex relationship, which I'm not going to go into too much today, but um, you know, certain uh, fundings were available and some great projects uh, happened. Um, and I'm just going to go quickly through some projects that continued with Desh Pradesh before our like loose group of visual artists were even called SAVAC. It was just, you know, whoever was involved loosely in the visual arts world and this uh, visual arts studio, I think it's a great example. Um, and it was curated by Rachel Compliment James, where again, it was about community and creating a space where those who were perhaps not artists, but could come through the space, engage with the artists. So the artists were in residence for a period of time, which was, um, I think, a really a wonderful way to sort of build the community in conversation. It's just one image from that project. And so um, others that continued at that time, I'm gonna skip through some of these fairly quickly, some of the uh, work I was doing in the mid nineties um, and bringing it between what I was doing in New York and I'm back to Toronto. And at the time of this particular show, um, Again, I'm not showing all the, the shows that were happening, but usually they were on an annual basis in conjunction with this three to five day Desh Pradesh festival, which was arts, culture, politics. And it was really uh, extremely radical um, left and uh, you know that mix between progressive politics and arts that we're really seeing reemergence re of today. Um, and this is the first time also the name SAVAC, uh, South Asian Visual Arts Collective, was used and created a kind of collective identity. And the following year, um, we, uh, so this is a slide from that uh, installation. And I apologize, we don't have the best documentation. We have old slides, poorly scanned. Um, and so I call this section of my talk, sisters are doing it for themselves because we, it really was, um, you know, led by uh, women artists and women identifying artists uh, within uh, Toronto. And so it wasn't exclusively a feminist space, but uh, that really was uh, an underpinning. Um, and so here are some projects when uh, SAVAC again became a uh, year round uh, artist run center doing programs not only with Desh Pradesh but trying to do exhibitions public programs year round and also in one of these very early shows seeking beautiful Indian girls uh, again critiquing this very sort of exoticized way in which uh, even the South Asian community um, the diaspora community was seen um, as a uh, Again, this monolithic Indian identity, which uh, Savak continues even today to uh, kind of challenge. Um, some more images from, from that show. And uh, in terms of my own role within it, um, I had been curating various projects here and there as an artist. Uh, but again, I think that there's a, a real place to, again, have an oh, perhaps other conversation about what it means to curate uh, from a community-based space, um, artist-led community-based curating, which is very different from uh, the traditional role of art historians, curators. So I always qualify that, that um, uh, you know, especially in the early days, uh, we were doing this uh, together and we would just usually kind of appoint somebody. You know, you, you, you organize this one or curate this one, I'll do the next one. 
etc. And so we were making space for ourselves within community. And so it really was, again, similar to the project, uh, the Savak Studio earlier, of how artists came together, developed the project, one person would lead it. Um, and uh, it created like lifelong kind of networks and communities and like our artistic family. Okay, and so a lot of text here, but this is, uh, again, I don't like to speak of myself in the third person, but this is in the uh, presentation we did for Savak, for those of you who might be interested in how it actually, because it's a very important moment in Canadian art history when we're, I think we were the first or one of the first to actually as a racialized group uh, get that designation. And there was real pushback in Toronto, I have to be honest, because um, center, other centers that were there didn't quite see how we fit in because we didn't operate like a traditional gallery. And I, I sort of chose that stance very, very intentionally to say that there's all these existing spaces and we were already in a place where everyone was saying, okay, to any of the brown artists, go, go over there, go into your corner over here with Savak. And I was more interested in, I guess, the word I've always used is uh, like infiltration. There's existing spaces. Uh, let us uh, really infiltrate and take over these spaces uh, change them in a way that they are far more open, receptive, transparent, um, accessible. Um, so let's go through a few more. So I also just want to really kind of honor the, the fact that I was there, I was working as the first director, I was not doing it on my own. It was an entire steering committee. Uh, many people were involved uh, during these times. Some of those folks are sitting in this room or have, have even met with very recently. And I think it's really important to bring faces to that because oftentimes we just see images of the art. And I have to say, I'm a little guilty of that too. I was like really focused on getting really good documentation of the art, but that's a key thing. But then another part of that story uh, has to also be remembered. So um, offering that here, um, and this is, uh, my other crew in, in New York and Godzilla, uh, you know, has sort of had a second rising um, and yet uh, they're still as uh, politically kind of uh, hardline <laughs> as they were in the past. And, you know, we, we walked out of a retrospective show that we were supposed to have with a museum in New York uh, just due to uh, the museum sort of relationship with um, carceral culture in um, in New York. Um, and yeah, and I also wish I had a few more images of a, another group, uh, Saucy, which is in New York, South Asian Women's Creative Collective, which has kind of been very foundational to a lot of the work I've done um, in terms of organizing, curating, as well as uh, just as being part of their artist community. Uh, so this is a quote from one of the very sort of early uh, artists involved with um, Savak reiterating. So this is a recent quote, again, reiterating what those early goals were, right? And I think it's always important to go back. It was really important for me to go back and revisit Casper's words. Um, and then um, being sort of mindful of time here, I'm just gonna highlight one of the projects that I worked on with Savak um, that I, you know, it was just really, again, important to me, and I think also important to a lot of the artists involved with it. Um, and um, another variation of this project, I was actually able to do again this past year, but in Lahore, Pakistan. So uh, for me, that's really kind of a beautiful way to cut, again, this idea of circles, revisiting, uh, but also being very mindful of not just staying in the past. Um, so, okay, so I, this was done at a time where I had just uh, left Sabak because I had this uh, curatorial residency at the AGO. But uh, again, my stance on infiltration, uh, my idea was to bring Sabak in with me, right? How can I uh, just sort of create my public commons within this very large, often very um, unwelcoming institution? Um, and so this particular project, you can read about it um, on Savak or 
uh, AGO's website, but really was about thinking about Canadian art and Canadian um, going into the Canadian historical galleries. And so uh, one of the things that I did uh, was to recruit somebody, uh, uh, Shutba uh, uh, Biswas, who is a UK-based artist, uh, but she is part of the Black Arts Movement that emerged a little bit earlier than this in the mid-80s uh, and was very involved with that. And that was sort of a coalition of, uh, you know, Black and Brown um, artists in the UK doing what we were trying to do um, 10 years later. And so uh, brought uh, Shutapa in. Uh, this is a solo show of hers that was curated. It was this completely empty space with just a small uh, video monitor the side of, size of a tablet cut into the wall with this woman who's just quietly crying uh, in the space. Um, and uh, I'll go through it fairly quickly um, if you want some of the text of what the project was about, but it, uh, again, really is about a lot of those ideas of surveillance and what does it mean to the private and the public uh, space. And so uh, is the text, and again, I can make this available. If people want to read these materials. Some of them are on my website um, if you want to go through them later. But here's some of the artists that were involved uh, with the project. And uh, Shethapa, um then uh, worked as the guest curator, and then we uh, developed this project, which um, was really quite incredible. But the stories behind the scene, the challenges of working with such a huge institution, and in a way that uh, hadn't been done before, uh, and with a group of artists that uh, were often um, treated as, you know, guests at the table, not necessarily people who would come in for a quick moment and should feel extremely welcome uh, or grateful to be at that table. And so uh, those are really complex conversations that were happening behind the scenes to even make this project happen. So just to give you a sense of the space, if anyone's been to the AGO, the Canadian Historical Galleries, uh, what some of the artists did was actually create one artist, Mira Sethi, created didactic materials uh, that were sitting with the other materials that you would read and that would uh, talk about the, uh, you know, the racialized history of, of the Americas and specifically the Canadian context, the, the railway workers, things that were not found uh, within the stories of this particular space. Um, and again, apologize. So he, these are some of the materials she would have, uh, historical images with text, Again, uh, questioning uh, the absence uh, of these histories within uh, Canadian uh, art spaces, uh, Canadian, I guess, textbooks and histories in general. Uh, Asma Mahmoud uh, was uh, doing this work that was actually an audio work um, as you kind of lift this curtain over this naked body um, uh, that was really just purely a device used in, oft, uh, in museums with works on paper, but it has another whole reading when you think about the cultural context which Asma came from in Pakistan and the uh, visibility of uh, the female body or the invisibility. And uh, another artist, Nina Aurora, was uh, doing this incredible work that um, I just uh, was fortunate to participate in a video shoot where she walked around the museum, she has a background in contemporary dance and created an entire performance physically interacting with the artwork, with the furnishings within the space, like lying down in the gallery, uh, swirling like a dervish, et cetera. And, also, and the uh, narrative text over her piece uh, was as if you were uh, visiting a gallery and you put on the headsets and it tells you about how you should see the work and it became about how do you see her body uh, as a work of art within the space? Um, and that's Nina Aurora. Uh, Rachel Galpana James was also on the project. Um, and uh, she was sort of, um, again, I hate to sum these up in very quick ways, but uh, a very particular moment in history uh, where there was a strong interest in Eastern spirituality um, and you had uh, people interested in um, 
the occult as well. So there was uh, this very interesting moment where um, there were Canadian artists involved. Rabindranath Tagore was invited uh, to, to Canada, and I believe he didn't make the trip. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, even protests within places like India against uh, the colonial empire, so especially the British colonial empire. Um, so those kinds of related histories uh, woven through a personal text uh, and diary and collection of uh, other archival materials and mapping. And uh, they were done in such a discreet way. So you often would walk into the space and not know that you were um, within an art project or within an intervention. Uh, so it really relied on people uh, just sort of discreetly coming across um, items in the space. Um, and then I will go into uh, speaking a bit more directly to my own practice and the kind of work I was doing as an artist simultaneously. I used to think I was wearing different hats, like my curator hat, I would teach, I'm wearing my educator hat or my artist hat. And I'm beginning to realize more and more that it's actually all one practice. Again, that, that circular way of sort of beginning to, it took me I think maybe 30 years to figure that out, that it really is kind of one practice uh, that has multiple components, um, and but they all relate and very deeply, and they're very deeply intertwined rather than being separate kind of activities. Um, so uh, some of these works, I think I was showing elements of before, uh, but if you remember I'd shown earlier on um, the Elephanta Caves and uh, my first kind of uh, contemporary response to that experience many, many years earlier was this work, Journey to the Muses, um, which uh, was inspired by a particular kind of topographical mapping. And this actually uh, is borrowed in some ways from Anish Kapoor and he was doing sculptures of uh, topographical maps. Uh, one of them actually is on site in Toronto. And uh, I was working at his gallery and they were smaller sculptures. And I basically so I repurposed Anish Kapoor um, in this work. Um, I'm gonna go back for a minute. And so you see these like, uh, the gallery was generally very darkly lit. So you really had these hanging flashlights that were within the space. And that's what was lighting the work. And you had these arrows from the map on the floor that would bring you closer to these fairly monumental figures. Um, so a few details. And so again, um, this is during this period, I began to very actively work on my own independent kind of art education because none of this was work I was exposed to in all my many, many years of undergraduate, graduate school, or even uh, in high school. Uh, but these were the two key sort of art forms when we think about South Asian or Indian art, it tends to be the miniature painting and the temple sculptures. And I was interested in how things, again, through visual culture, uh, almost become uh, these motifs uh, that represent the culture as a whole or the cultural production. And of course, it's always uh, set in the past uh, as something that is not a living, breathing thing. Um, and so since I was finally getting some exposure to living, breathing, contemporary art coming out of South Asia, I wanted to uh, find a way to continue to create a narrative that would build on um, these multiple sort of moments in time and place. Um, and so, uh, just go through some of these works, mixed media. This is actually paper towel on top of uh, acrylic on paper. Uh, I actually began to create works that were more and more ephemeral um, and really sort of coming off the traditional idea of canvas paper um, and working with materials that were often uh, ready-made, disposable, and yet precious. And um, so this work ceremonial was kind of a point where I began to bring all these ideas together. So at the very front, you have these, oops, I'll go back a bit, sorry. Um, oops, I'm not, I'm going the wrong direction. I apologize. 
Uh, these are large rolls of vellum uh, that have watercolor prints, rubber stamps that are printed on, again, these figures of uh, temple dancers. I was really interested in this idea of working, collecting these images of women through Indian art history uh, and the stories and imagining what the stories may be. And specifically the Devdasi, which is a tradition of temple dancers. Um, and there were, uh, in terms of art history, a very significant number of uh, sculptures that were extremely uh, uh, beautiful, also very uh, sexual and very exuberant. And so women who were oftentimes musicians, dancers, singers were depicted in a lot of the uh, sculptural work of the medieval era. Um, and so as I began to collect all this, I began to uh, make my, my own versions. So um, there's wallpapers on the top, wax candles began to appear in my work for the first time uh, there. And then I began to take reproductions because most of my access was completely through, through books earlier and later through uh, what was available online. And so I began to create these mixed media works, uh, bringing women from these completely different periods that uh, somehow began to invade each other's space and create new narrative worlds that would never have logically existed at the time. Um, and so a few more detailed works. And there's often, again, the deterioration of the image, loss of image, um, because I'm often very interested in uh, like selected moments, selected vignettes, and taking them in and out of context. Um, so more works and where the bodies here, specifically the female uh, Devdasi dancer bodies begin to abstract through a kind of decorative pattern. Um, and in these works, uh, they begin to, again, merge into one new thing where it's not so obviously a collage, uh, but then I began to collage them as well. So I was just trying out different things. This is on... Uh, a collection of uh, the battas, which are scarves that especially South Asian women from North India often wear. So these were handed down from family members and many friends and family members and other random bits from popular culture begin to invade these spaces, create new spaces. Uh, and they were they were quite, you know, kind of playful and uh, Again, you wouldn't really understand what was happening in that particular moment till you got up very close. So there's a very also interesting in what happens when you are kind of face to face up close with an image and how you read that versus what does it look like from across the room. And I like when the, the story shifts because here you see perhaps decorative patterns until you come up close and then you begin to see that there's actually the pattern of the paper towel actually has female bodies that are also patterned on top. Let's go through some of these quickly. Sorry, I'm just trying to, how am I doing for time? Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, all right, great. And so I began to do these large works on paper, it's acrylic on canvas, a series called Hey Ladies. Um, and again, I was interested in how do I create uh, a new kind of iconography, new aesthetics, uh, but also was really inspired by sort of pop culture, pop art specifically, and how even through screen printing processes, you have um, a set series of colors that you can reproduce in different ways. So I created a, a flat color scheme. Um, and that color scheme was used throughout the series without any intermixing of color. Um, and oftentimes, again, I'm interested in what happens in how you read a story when you come up close from a distance, people thought they were silk screened, et cetera. As you get up close, um, they begin to have the, the, the mark of the artist, the hand mark um, there as well. And some other sort of uh, mixed media collages. And the references and materiality, uh, you know, sort of changes over time. Sorry, I'll go back. 
Um, this particular series, you can see the mapping. Mapping kind of comes in and out of my work. It's always kind of there. It's not always visible. But this idea of mapping and even, I think, Bobir, as you're reading my, my biography, I don't often present that very long biography. But um, the fact that I'm a child of like refugees of part India's partition plays like a huge role. And the mapping here very specifically is um, about those borders between India and Pakistan using earlier mapping uh, that you know, geopolitical kind of mapping that keeps, seems to keep shifting over time. Okay, and then here again from a distance, just looks uh, like wallpaper patterning, um, close again using these bodies, but also um, this piece is called Takeaway. I began to find ways and was really interested in how can I have some kind of uh, audience engagement and I really, uh, this idea of disposability, materials that are valued or unvalued, uh, what does it mean when now you can take a paper napkin away with you? Some people have kept them as precious objects, other people, you know, wipe their lips with it. <laughs> people have very different sort of responses when you actually hand them something. Um, and oftentimes these are spaces where you can come sit down. Um, some of them are entire rooms where you, really is the idea of um, almost the, as installation art it is the purpose is often to transport you uh, take you uh, within within the work and within the for me a particular story or narrative that is often and the narrative is not often clear it's not like a singular narrative that you can follow in a story but my idea is that all of us uh, will have our own kind of reading of the these images and create our own stories. And so more and more, I like to let uh, the viewer come in and create a version of the story for themselves. Um, and this is uh, one version that was created after I did a, a residency in, in Chile, in Santiago. And we also did a project in a small fishing village nearby, which was actually, I'm not showing images of it right now, but it was like sort of a really beautiful moment to kind of get out of sort of larger cities and see how contemporary artists can also interact with a community that um, uh, doesn't really have a direct relationship to contemporary art. And how do you sort of engage a community and uh, with a community collaborate where um, people from this small fishing village allowed us to uh, create art all around uh, various parts of the town, right? And then they also engaged with it, helped with the project, and uh, became a really great sort of new community. Okay, and so uh, one part of the project in uh, Chile was, uh, uh, for me, visiting uh, this uh, sort of massive colonial site that's uh, actually on top of a an indigenous burial ground, uh, which obviously speaks perfectly to the goals of empire. And um, I began to photograph this site and I've always had this kind of love, fascination and revulsion to these colonial sites. Um, having been raised in India, seeing uh, a fair amount there, uh, but I related to this, this site as well. And I found the moments where uh, it was really beautiful, but it was also in a great state of decay. So I, I found all those moments of beautiful decay um, and decided to focus on um, those for this uh, like sitting room. So you would come into this darkened room um, and this is a whole other project, uh, but I'll just go back and show you uh, the installation view where you'd walk again into this kind of um, neo-colonial parlor room. Uh, it was fairly darkly lit. Um, and so I've often used like the un, sort of non-traditional lighting in uh, these spaces. Um, and this was at Gallery 44 in Toronto. Um, and then we're, we'll come to this piece, um, Pink is Navy Blue of India. Uh, for years I've uh, done a lot of work that is in video and video installation. And um, I don't have, uh, didn't think I'd have time to show the video component, 
but uh, it is up on Vimeo if you want to see a clip of it there. And Rashmi Verma, who's sitting here, <laughs> is <laughs> thank you for this beautiful collaboration. Um, I really had sort of wanted to create a narrative about a woman who is um, in a fashion boutique uh, at a particular moment in time where there was a real obsession with Indian fashion, Bollywood, uh, and really trying to this idea that it could be easily consumed and um, by sort of you know Western designers um, and people who were interested in this idea of global pop culture that uh, was easily digestible. Um, and so this woman goes into the space and in kind of a fit of madness begins to literally physically consume and interact with a lot of the uh, the garments and such within the space of uh, uh, contemporary fashion boutique. And so this is the installation version um, set up to, so we did a number of presentations of this project. And in this particular version of the design exchange, some of Rashmi, who's a fashion designer, has uh, some of her garments up. There was a clothing rack of garments. So as a gallery visitor, you could, uh, there wasn't a change room, but you could hold clothes up and look at yourself in a mirror while you're watching this woman within a fashion boutique. Um, and the title of the work also comes from a very famous uh, fashion quote by Diane Reeland, uh, editor of uh, Vogue magazine, uh, in her description of the influence of Indian design and fashion. And I love this image, especially licking quotes. And uh, this is a, a beautiful sort of uh, table arrangement uh, Rashmi had made and became part of the installation at the site. Okay, and so uh, I'll try and go through these fairly quickly. This was shot at Toronto Pearson Airport, another narrative of a group of women. I often just have these uh, stories that begin to form in my head and somehow I, I try to find a way to visualize them. Uh, so somehow, fortunately, I've been able to have access. And this is also about infiltration. How do you infiltrate an airport? <laughs> How do you sort of get permissions? And somehow or other, being tenacious, being uh, creative, it is possible. Um, and they allowed us to come in, do the shoot. Uh, we had some, um, I had requested if possible, could some airport workers participate in this? So I had this gathering of South Asian women who were travelers and South Asian women who were airport workers. And what is that relationship between uh, the laborers within this environment and those who are free to move in and out of the airport spaces and the class and the privileges that all of these narratives entail. Uh, and so these are a few images from this project. And sorry, I only had one there. Uh, House of the Rising Sun, this video is also up on Vimeo. Uh, and it has a uh, woman who is engaging with two uh, incredible sites in India and more and more so became interested in the relationship between the female body and environment, space, constructed space, architecture. And so these two sites in India, uh, one of them is a former British uh, courthouse that became uh, apartments uh, during a post-partition. Uh, and then now, unfortunately, was raised so that you could put up some high rises, right? So that's kind of the evolution of that building. And the one with the staircase is actually uh, a modernist house built by that first generation of Indian modernist architects, so Charles Korea. This is a Charles Korea small home that I feel so fortunate to have access to, and this wonderful dancer, Nishalal, who uh, uh, created a, an interactive uh, kind of immediate physical response to these environments. So she didn't go in, we didn't choreograph it. It was a very kind of physical response to being in these two very different, but yet to me, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they also speak to each other. There's a conversation between these two buildings as well as this woman. Um, and for me, another sort of 
side thread is uh, the history of modernism and its place in uh, the global south, and especially South Asia. We think about Bangladesh, India. We had Corbusier come in and build the city um, of Chandigarh, but with the help uh, of many uh, Indian ar architects and builders uh, who obviously don't have the same acclaim, even though he came and visited a few times um, in his development of the city. Um, and also these are very masculine spaces. That's another kind of uh, interest to have is how does a woman sort of navigate through her body these spaces that weren't really made for her um, and uh, uh, this project sorry um, how am I doing okay great okay and so this project peacock wallpaper um, sort of continues the this sort of interest in um, women's lives histories uh, how do we inhabit space it's also uh, based in a very famous American short story, uh, The Yellow Wallpaper, sort of a feminist classic. And this was, I did a rewriting of it called The Peacock Wallpaper. And when you're in the space, uh, there's an audio track and the audio track is like a ghost story where this woman, like same as The Yellow Wallpaper, this woman who's been confined to her room. And again, this idea of hysteria, madness, in the space, she's confined to the room by her husband. Why is she confined? Um, what is it about her that is um, so dangerous? And so, uh, you know, uh, we would sometimes use words like jungly, <laughs> if that uh, has a reference, but the, these women who can't be contained. And so um, when you're in the space, the audio speaks to you for about 20 minutes in, her, in the voice of the woman you see in these uh, images. So, and again, I just feel so fortunate. I was able to shoot in this incredible space that um, uh, really was like this ideal setting for this story. And uh, I really sort of feel grateful for that. And, you know, we made costumes or uh, design costumes, had them in these, all of this was done on a completely ad hoc guerrilla style budget. <laughs> and uh, I'll go quickly through a few of these other works. Um, I mean, I won't speak about them too much, but um, my sort of work in airports and spaces, and I'll just say that uh, pictograms and signage that you find in public space, uh, really is also being I'm really interested in just language, visual culture. And I think for me, pictograms is uh, something so perfect and slight manipulation of pictograms changes the story. And this particular one, uh, in this moment, I'd like to also acknowledge, uh, you know, what's happening in the Middle East and this particular work, Layla Layla, um, is uh, the narrative within it actually uh, is based on, uh, is it Leila Hamid, who was with the PL, uh, the earlier version of the, the PLO, uh, and there was a plane hijacking um, in, that was linked to Bo the Bombay airport at this particular moment. So this idea of, and then using like Bollywood type storytelling uh, but how you can take sort of things that are happening in our very real world moments, uh, but yet um, find ways to uh, tell the story in a different way. Uh, but I think she was the very first um, female plane hijacker. And that story, I think, is rarely uh, sort of the link to India and it starting out, the plane starting out from there. Uh, is something that I, I still can't find very much information on. Mm -hmm. okay. And then these works, uh, uh, I'll show you, I'll just go very quickly through a number of works where, um, again, I've been using the pictograms, this idea of the giveaway, um, and I've been using lollipops a lot because there's this idea of, you know, never take candy from a stranger, and the stranger uh, trying to lure people into these strange stories and strange interactions. 
So with this project, I give you, when you come, there's usually a desk with a set of instructions. You have to follow those instructions in an exact manner before you're handed a lollipop. Um, and, uh, you know, there, it, it actually really upsets people a lot and other people really see it as playful. So again, they, I'm interested in that. What happens? Why are you reading this particular um, narrative and this idea of, uh, you know, this power exchange? And for me, that the power exchanges that kind of happen between the narratives that I'm making uh, are in some, you know, small way, again, should hopefully remind you of the kinds of power imbalances that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And for those of us uh, who identify as immigrants, refugees, undocumented, et cetera, uh, airports, border controls hold all kinds of uh, tensions. And so I've been working a lot with, you know, particular kind of signage that uh, you will see in the United States, uh, especially along border crossings. And so I created my own uh, fictional uh, Peace Force security company. Uh, and then within uh, these kinds of booths, I create these booths with the wallpaper. You have to kind of go through uh, this ritualized transaction with me. Um, and it's meant to be fairly, uh, this borderline of, again, is it playful, is it disturbing, and everybody continues to have uh, very different reactions to uh, these pieces. I'm going to go through this one quickly, because I don't think I um, have enough time to talk about it. But again, it's, yeah, it's uh, based in, again, my research of uh, South Asian diasporic women who have been uh, lost to history, or again, fragments of uh, their histories are available to, to me, to us. And so uh, for about the last 10 plus years, I've been researching uh, women who have had some kind of public presence. Uh, so for example, in one of them, Amrusani is a real woman. I often create fictional characters based on multiple women, but Amrusani is a real person. Uh, uh, Indo-Caribbean um, is somebody who was active as a singer and performer, was in some films from the 1940s uh, onwards to about the 1960s, traveled the world extensively. Uh, the only woman I know of, of is from the South Asian diaspora in that time who performed in India, performed in the Caribbean, performed all over Europe, all over North America. She was on Broadway. <laughs> no, you know, she was uh, probably, from what I understand, probably the first South Asian woman on Broadway. Uh, she was on TV with Elvis on his very first, uh, you know, television screening. And some still don't know. And then she kind of disappears, and then we know very little about her. So it gives me space as an artist to imagine, right? And I hope she would be okay with me reimagining what her story may be. Um, and then these pieces, I am gonna give these for now. Uh, this one, Sisters of Shakti continues. It's a, another sort of fictional community I've created, which is meant to be a utopian uh, feminist uh, commune, right? And so I advertise it on Instagram, I try to recruit people into the commune, but you have to be female identified. <laughs> uh, and uh, then people go through this ritual and make you chant a mantra. Uh, you get stamped on the head um, and then you have to kind of promise to continue with uh, that work. Okay, so I'm gonna close off very quickly. This is some of my more recent work from last year. Uh, I was recreating these works that were actually made, like this particular figure on the ground uh, is based on my own body proportions. I'm five feet tall, it's a five foot female uh, silhouette. Um, and when we think about even like at a crime scene, the chalk outline <laughs> was definitely an inspiration for this. Um, and for me, this was a moment where actually my entire studio was destroyed. So I lost, you know, some works going back to 30 years, 
including this, you know, hundreds of those red candles I had used previously. So this is a memorial to the loss of my own artwork. And re what does it mean to then go back and recreate, but yet shift, right? You can never go back and be completely uh, there. Uh, but I'm finding, trying to find ways through that loss, create my own sort of memorials and rituals. Uh, and so there's an audio piece that goes with this work, uh, which uh, is a lament, uh, you know, a, a lament song. Uh, few more, so more from that series of the melted candles. Um, and then um, this particular uh, seminar and exhibition that I uh, was fortunate to be invited to it goes back to my links with groups like uh, SAVAC. And so uh, one of the artists, Asma Mahmoud, uh, who had participated in that original project at the AGO, uh, has, was very inspired by it and wanted to create a new version of it in Pakistan, uh, but with a colonial museum, right, in, in South Asia. And uh, so just uh, skim through some of these images. This is the Lahore Museum. Uh, Kipling, Rudolf, uh, Rudyard Kipling's father was, uh, I believe, the first curator of this site. So this is a very, uh, and it holds some of the most important artifacts art objects of, uh, from, the, from the past uh, and not as much of the present, but it really kind of is a museum that's set in its own time and place. Um, and the contemporary arts community uh, generally felt very, very uh, isolated in terms of uh, from this institution. There wasn't really an engagement between the local arts community, uh, which is very, very active Pakistan and India and South Asia, again, have very, very active contemporary experimental art scenes. Uh, but this museum didn't really seem to want to or provide a place for them. Um, and so using my <laughs> guerrilla tactics and uh, sweet talking and you know finding ways to get into the space, uh, we made it happen. We didn't think it would. We often, often these projects, you don't know what will happen, but until you try, everybody in Lahore told me this is never going to happen. And we made it happen. And it wasn't just me, it was we. We made it, we somehow not only got into the space, but we were um, able to bring in uh, contemporary responses and very directly engaging with the colonial histories of that museum and of, of the society, right? Uh, so, um, and I was very inspired by this text, which you can look up. Um, and so uh, she wrote a wonderful essay about the, the project as well, Sheila Bhatti. Uh, and this, for me, this concept of the Ajib Khan or Ajib Khan was really uh, my inspiration for then, uh, not only like I came in as visiting artist, so I had my own art project in the space, but in terms of working with this, amazing team of emerging artists uh, who uh, developed work themselves in this space. And so this is some of the interior shots. And I also just really wanted to point out, uh, again, it was about conversation. And these images were really important to me. Uh, sorry, going back to this conference room, because when you're in this conference room, you actually see you see the portraits in the back of all the directors. This is a space that no one uh, at that table ever felt they would have access to, right? So to be sitting there at the table where all the important decisions for the museum were made, and then to contribute ideas about what they could offer in that space. And even today, I think now there's a director who's more open to these ideas, and the artist community that that is their space and they are finding ways to create more and more projects and uh, build a better kind of, not only access, but just to make it into a living, breathing, contemporary uh, space. Okay, so then there was the exhibition. Um, I have, this is my work in the show and for me to be able to show my work right next to uh, historical, you know, art objects that I had admired and looked at for ages was like a real gift 
to actually have my work in conversation with the works that they were inspired by. So go through that. Uh, and uh, then there was a video, but I'm not sure if it, uh, it's very quick and I'm not sure if it will play now the video. Mm, that's okay. So I can, again, anyone's interested in the video of the other artists who are involved with it, I can show, show that. And so I'll close off by saying again, for me, uh, this has been sort of a really interesting year of thinking about what it means to not only uh, plant seeds, but also to collect seeds, share the seed, uh, and having conversations with uh, my fellow artists, colleagues, uh, friends, family, about what it means to kind of have the life of an artist in community with others. Um, and so here's uh, within this year, some of the projects I've been working on and some of the, some of my, you know, artist family. And then this one is ongoing. Uh, this particular group, I'm uh, creating a, a, we're creating a, a zine that will be launched on November the 8th. Uh, via wrong. So if you just uh, are interested, you could go to the wrong website and uh, four of us will be uh, talking about this year long residency. Thank you. Patious and generous in sharing your work uh, and practice across these many years, and um, I'm I'm gonna sort of orient my questions and sort of um, I guess provocations, kind of going more in the order of of how you presented. Um, and first off, I want to start off too by saying, like, I really. Um, one, I, I, you know, I want to say I'm very sorry for your loss. I really appreciate how you began with your uncle. And um, I know you're going to be on your way to, to see him off uh, uh, in terms of funeral soon. So I just want to say I really appreciated you sort of beginning with this loss and sharing that. And, and given, you know, how you reference to what is happening in the world, sort of informing your talk through loss, but also thinking about what, you know, kinds of forms of, you um, loss and regeneration might might be able to be propelled. And so I just want to start there. Um, my sort of, I, I noted the usage of the the, the concept of, of space and the way you were talking about it in really interesting ways and throughout sort of especially earlier with the kinds of works of collectively orienting, whether it was through Savak, whether it was through these different ARCs. I am curious about sort of this the sort of way that you're talking about first off like making space forming community spaces what that means in terms of what you were saying around safe space and then you know even the idea of like renting right so thinking about how space in and of itself is a kind of relation that you're sort of especially earlier on we're sort of having forced to think about in a way of like trying to just gather right gather your closest friends, your comrades, those fellow artists, those that were, um, you know, thinking and creating with you, um, and you know, you working alongside them, and what it meant to to use this as a motif of, you know, space, but also of infiltration of space, right? Traditional spaces, uh, traditional, you know, artists, art institutions like the museum, right? Um, you know, I'm thinking of the way that in something like uh, Nicole Fleetwood's Marking Time, she sort of marks how the museum is supposed to be in some ways this direct opposite to something like the prison, right? Because the museum's supposed to uphold the positive and good values of what we are supposed to aspire to be. So understanding this as framed as sort of antithetical to something where, you know, deviants and bad values will go, right? So the museum also being a space in which in some ways you are infiltrating in which you also like politically and ethically, there is a sort of like counter 
movement that that you yourself, along with your your friends and colleagues and comrades, have. So I would love to hear more about how you sort of think about space, about your work in these sort of more traditional museums, the colonial museums, even the questions that you're posing, or I, I don't know where the, the question of the, what is the museum of the future, right? So like, I am curious about how you yourself, along with your friends and comrades are sort of figuring what space is to you, how you how you sort of work, you know, from the ARC through the museum, like the tensions that also arise. Um, because part of it is like what you offer them, how that also the, those feelings of, of the extractive quality of those institutions. So I, I'd love to hear more about that. Wow, that's a lot. I know, I'm sorry. That's a good <laughs> question. Yeah, I know, but it's like seven uh, questions. Yeah, yeah. I have very complicated feelings about it. It's um, some of the difficulties, which a lot of what I'm presenting is like the joy of it, but the part I didn't focus on there is like the the difficulties and the enormous like you, you spoke about extracting labor labor and that's a huge part of it is that all this work that was happening was predominantly unpaid creative and intellectual labor um and um it's yeah, it's it's very complicated because uh, it creates uh, burnout. It creates uh, you know intercommunal conflict, um, and so even within all the groups that I've mentioned, uh, we have had many internal struggles, um, and those uh, you know those relationships have been really tested. And I think that it's important to, for me, and I wanted to acknowledge that after I presented, that the work is really, really hard. And there's a very high price you pay for like wanting to continue doing the work. Many people walk away, right? Because it's um, it brings up all kinds of trauma. It brings up, um, you know, especially I think for, um, those of us here in the diaspora who have immigrant histories, et cetera, and who have, uh, I mean, even sitting here, we, we exist in a colonial space and how that affects our worldview, how, how that affects our sense of scarcity, how that affects our sense of competition. Um, and there, there's, yeah, it's it's very. I'm still working through it. Yeah, and I, you know, sometimes joke. I feel like uh, racialized artists and arts workers. We need our own therapy groups because it is. It, it takes a real toll. And there's times where I've just like had to step back, slow down. You know, things come in waves, and there isn't. Um, you know, there, and again. There, there is within, especially in North America, uh, we have a particular kind of access, but it's conditional. And that conditional access um, creates a very precarious situation for artists, for academics, for those of us who are wanting to do the work. It's a precarious place. Yeah, maybe I'll leave it there. <laughs> No, so much is just conjured. It never gets easier. <laughs> no. Let's put it that way. It never gets easier. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really, I really appreciate, yeah, your your honesty and sort of, I mean, another qu question too I had was, I mean, I'm thinking specifically of, about the work that you've done um, creatively, right? And I think it's really important that you put it into this context of like, you know, it's taken you 30 years to come to the, to the, of like the knowledge, the self-knowledge of like, oh, all of this is actually part of, part and parcel of one practice that is just multi-pronged. Yeah. Um, and so I am curious about, too, like the way that some of the ways that you were speaking about how you and your, your artist friends and colleagues, like were making this kind of work about surveillance pre-9-11, right? So there is this sort of sense of like, this investment in thinking about the tensions between visibility, invisibility, hypervisibility, 
prior to this particular sort of like moment where, you know, in the 21st century, where we sort of get this discourse around surveillance that's much more sort of prominent. But I am curious, like, what something like, um, just to make sure I get it correct, uh, the private thoughts, public moments, like what you were doing there, um, how surveillance sort of plays a part um, of your practice, the way that you're thinking about, it, especially with the iconography, like in the, um, the pictograms, right? Like, I think of that as such unique work and the way that it sort of plays out in this way that is about these forms of public recognition, that we understand that these are symbols or understand that these are things that we're supposed to to read in particular ways. So I am I am curious about the the work and tension around surveillance, security, what is private, what is public, um, and how that sort of manifests throughout your career. Yeah. Um, I can just speak for myself. It's I think being a fairly strong thread. And I think it's a good question because I think that there was a time where I probably was less conscious of it, like it was there, uh, but I hadn't yet found, or it hadn't found its way into my work in a more direct way as it does with uh, some of the work I've been doing in the last number of years, uh, 10 years or so. Um, but I think those ideas, and I, I think very specifically, there's an artist, Keith Piper, who was doing work in, uh, from the Black Arts Movement in the UK, was doing work that I was seeing. And so I feel like there, there's been a lot of work that I have been very moved by. And his work, again, that relationship between uh, the Black male body and the surveillance state, um, I think was very profound for me to see see how he was using that. And uh, probably has that and many others have sort of influenced the way um, in terms of the, the aesthetics of this kind of, uh, you know, imperial violence, right? And how do you work with the, and also how do you aestheticize state violence or even like with the one uh, with, uh, Leila Hamid, um, which is, you know, um, yeah, plane hijackings and such. It's, uh, it's one I really struggle with because uh, violence, state violence, but also uh, violence against the female body in sort of the domestic sphere has been like sort of a strong, uh, yeah, has, has sort of always been strongly present in my work. Um, and I think that relationship between the domestic sphere and the violence with that can happen within that space. And there's a number of stories that in, in projects that I haven't shown where I deal very much with the violence, violence against and murder of, of young women. Um, so it's, again, sorry to say again, it, it's complex, it's there, it's omnipresent, uh, but it, it takes different forms. And I think uh, definitely post 9-11, and I think in this particular moment now that we are in, I'm just, um, I feel like the work for me, I've, it's always been there in terms of my comrades, my colleagues. Um, but maybe it became a little bit sharper, focused on our experience within the Americas, let's say, than the works I was seeing more in the 90s that oftentimes were speaking to political violence within South Asia, history of partition, those. But whereas now we're also, for my generation and beyond, we're, we're very much here. And we're very much part of the history here. And so we're probably even more so invested in critiquing that. So I will probably ask two more questions and then I wanna open it up um, because selfishly, I'm just like, I would ask a million more, but uh, for the sake of time, I wanna sort of, well, one thing too is like across your work, you know, in terms of thinking about the usage of, disposable materials. I really appreciate like the way that you use things like napkins and paper towels and these things that 
how you use them for patterning, for wallpaper, for these interiors is really, really, you know, sort of both beautiful, but also like it requires a, a level of attention. And especially because you're also oftentimes including text, right? And so that kind of like the, the way that that requires a particular kind of close reading, right? You need to literally, and I, I say this as someone who's like trained in literature and is just like, you know, like that relationship between, with artwork where you are both proximate, but also like having to do the work of like analysis, right? As you're, as you're looking and sitting with um, that work. And so what, what patterning and, and things like using these materials that are disposable, that can be thought of through, you know, both like loss and regeneration again, right? I wonder too if that has what that might mean in terms of like, you know, sort of like taking certain symbols and abstracting them, what that can do in terms of like creating a new kind of symbology, semiotics, right? Like how those, you know, kinds of pictograms or iconography, um, how they're repurposed, you know, in your work and what that does for the kinds of ways that audiences engage. Um, and consume your work. Um, and so I am curious, like, um, because it is sort of like, you, you, you know, it's very global the way that you approach it, right? In terms of like thinking about whether it's, you know, spaces of privilege like the airport and these forms of mobility, right? And then thinking about what that's doing in public space versus private. And so this is kind of a long winded question to sort of think about forms of abstraction, disposability, iconography, like how how those tensions play out for you? Like, how did you come to that, right? Yeah, it's a tough question. <laughs> um, it's good ones. Uh, how did I come to it? I think I'll just give one moment if that helps, right? So as I was in grad school, I'm at NYU and looking, like pouring through old art history textbooks of, you know, South Asian, you know, sculpture and going through these, looking for images of women and trying to read the narratives and stories within their depictions. Because again, you know, is this fanciful? Is this uh, idealized or is this fairly accurate depiction of uh, the way they, you know, in, uh, sorry, going back to even um, Devdasi's and Temple sculpture were based on real women who had a particular kind of, some would say, privileged status, but also they were kind of outside the um, the kind of norms and rules, they can move outside the norms and rules in which women's lives were constructed. And so I was very interested in that, that idea of um, how were they inhabiting a particular kind of very um, non, what I would see as a non-traditional kind of space for where women sat, even in India within that time. And so, but then I had to, you know, you have to, you wonder how much of this is fact and fiction. And I'm always interested in that line between what's the fact and what's the fiction of what the artist is bringing in. And so when I kind of allowed myself to also, um, allowed myself to like create, my own images and my own scenarios, vignettes, moments that were completely fictional, but they could have been real, right? They could have been based in some historical fact, right? Uh, and so the one quick story I'll tell is just uh, walking around downtown Manhattan um, with all these images in my head of these women, and I just walked by a storefront that had those wax female figurines and um, I didn't know what they were I had no cultural context for what they were but I immediately in them saw these women that I was looking at the sculptures and somehow I projected all my own fantasies into these figurines and so then I began to collect them and buy them and yeah I still had no idea why they were in the shop window what was their purpose 
um, and found out later that they were sometimes used in like Santeria rituals and things. And, I, and it's interesting because I often there was this, I'm, uh, you know, again, was interested in, again, the space of the temple and how do women uh, who uh, might, you know, some have also referred to them as temple prostitutes or temple courtesans. Um, and how the, all that fits into this idea of the sanctity of this holy space. You know, these women that don't really follow the rules of that society um, and very much own their own sexuality and have a very particular kind of independence. Uh, and then again, I project them into these possible Santeria candles and that then become part of my practice. So I think it was allowing myself to see links between things I would see around me um, and then they come into my studio and then they literally became a part of my life. They traveled the world with me, these candles. And yet to me, they're, you know, they have another life outside of my studio. But when they enter my studio, they kind of become part of this whole other narrative and narrative history. Right. So I don't know if that answers it a little bit. No, I mean, that's a very helpful example. It clarifies for me how you're sort of like, I don't know, your approach is just so um, I don't know, it's beautiful and it's unique. And it's, I mean, I'm also thinking too of just like the way that like, like Rajasthani block printing, the way that some of your, like for me, that's what I, when I saw your work initially, I was like, oh, this is like reminding me of like the, the many, like, you know, not only clothes, but like I'm a big stationary head. And so like the notebook, like, so there is this, this way that that kind of like relationship between what you might see on particular surfaces is like transformed through the body and through feminine movement right which yeah. is a also another major sort of theme in your work okay so I'm gonna finally end my questions that are always way too long um, and then I'll, I'll sort of turn it over to the audience but I am curious and this is kind of like a selfish question because I'm also just such a big fan of like Godzilla <laughs> so I am curious about maybe sort of thinking um about your work in Sevak and in Godzilla, what that kind of politics looks like, you know, from when you started with both organizations through now, like what that has sort of, you know, trans how it's been transformed, what um, the kind of maybe even like discrepancies between the politics, right? And sort of thinking about obviously Godzilla sort of being a Asian American, what that means in terms of particular kind of politics being informed by, you know, maybe some things more sort of um, invested in thinking about U.S. empire, for example, um, or the sort of roles of um, our institutions in relationship to, you know, carceral technologies, the war machine, et cetera. And then what that means also in terms of like SAVOC, in terms of Indo-Canada, sort of South Asian Canadian histories, and then even thinking about, you know, what that might mean in terms of like maybe the more, the other more uh, like larger um, communities involved, right? Maybe thinking also about in places like Swana or the Mena region and how how those are, what, how, what, what those lines are. I'm just sort of, you know, more curious than anything about how that's transformed over these years. Yeah, good question. It's, um, it has transformed. I feel like the goals were really, Initially, you know, we talk about DEI and uh, definitely it was about, you know, more diversity and definitely access. And I would definitely say now it seems uh, the equity aspect of that. And what does it mean to sit at the table as a guest versus, you know, inhabit that table and make key decisions at that table. So I think that, um, and you know, the, the language uh, wasn't, wasn't the same. Obviously we were not talking about decolonizing institutions while we were decolonizing institutions. Um, but I feel like it's, it's to me a really beautiful thread, but sometimes what gets lost is that, um, the, the long reach of this kind of activism um, is often not appreciated, right? And I think this is not a, 
something in the last five years. <laughs> and even before me, of course, I can only speak in my, my time talking about 30 years, but even before me, I have mentors who were doing that work from the 1980s onwards. And um, I think it's also really important for me to kind of honor that kind of groundwork that was started uh, and then my little place in it. And then I'm very excited about where things may go, right? And should go. So I think that the difference has been, uh, again, and even within my own development, going back to, let's say, for example, that project at the AGO, at every step of the way, we were made to feel like we should be grateful to have access to that space. It's like, well, you have access. You do, but that access is very limited. It's very conditional, um, and it does not lead to institutional change. Um, and while I was there, I wrote a report about that, that, that the need for that kind of institutional change, and it was completely buried, right? Um, and, but yet, I think at this particular moment, things are happening, but I think also, uh, I would always caution to not, not feel grateful you're just at the table. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot more work to do. Yeah. No, my friend and I, we always talk about ingratitude, being ingrates and what that means, especially there's this book by Erin Min called, it's called Ingratitude and she talks about it through the, the debt for specifically like Asian American daughters, right? And so there is this, I mean, I really appreciate that last note, so. Um, I will open it up now to questions from the audience. And I believe there's a microphone that we can circulate. If anyone online has questions too, just feel free to pop them in the chat. And yep. Should I wait or? Hi, Shelly, thanks so much. Um, my name is Anna. We met briefly on WhatsApp. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I thank you for, first of all, for such a comprehensive overview of the work that you've been doing and you're developing. Um, I have a two part question. The first part of it is, you know, you signal so beautifully to how you've worked to cultivate a particular South Asian intervention in the context of both Toronto and in New York. Um, and I'm wondering, and you're making reference particularly to the early 1990s. Um, I'm wondering how the relationship to art making and art practice to South Asia or diasporic South Asia has shifted as you start working with a collective like Rung, who's so West Coast specific. Um, and if you could speak a little bit about that sort of transition and what does that mean in terms of um, fostering a conversation about South Asian diasporic identity through the arts, making those East Coast, West Coast sort of connections. Um, and then the other end of it is, you know, you just gave this really beautiful example of finding those wax figurines that are used in Santeria rituals, but that you projected yourself onto them um, to, to make sense of what you were witnessing or what you were seeing. And I wonder what has been the sort of shifting priority for South Asian diasporic artists? Um, like who is the audience? Who are we trying to, to necessarily be legible to or make legible for through, our, through the individual sort of creative practice or collective um, artistic interventions? Okay, <laughs> where should I start? <laughs> Thank you. Um, give me the first part again. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, the show. Yes. And now you're working with folks like Farheen Huck on the West yeah. Coast. Like, how is that rung? And rung is. Per, like a huge central part of how South Asian artistic voices have been raised on that, in that part of the country. So, so I wonder like if you can, your own reflections really sure. about those sort of changing. Great, thank, yeah. thank you for doing that again. Um, so when I was uh, involved with Desh Padesh and Savak, one, one thing I wanted to highlight of that experience of the early nineties was in the Americas, there was nothing else. There was, Desh Pradesh was it in terms of if you wanted a radical, progressive, very contemporary experimental art space. Um, it was it. And so people were coming 
from South Asia. People were coming from the UK. There were like busloads of people who heard about it through word of mouth coming in from across Canada and across uh, the US. So that was like, it was, though it was Toronto based, it wasn't because suddenly, like, it was a convening of people blah, coming in from everywhere. And that was really incredible. And so even with Slavak, we tried to keep that stream, though, of course, being in Toronto, we were Toronto centric. But in terms of the artists um, and people came for lectures, we had a lot of artists coming in from South Asia. We had Gita Kapoor come do a lecture. We had key people. And we also had people who were between places, like I think of Rashid Rana, who I met as a young grad student who was trying to find, was living in the US and then was trying to settle in Canada, coming to Savak office with a handful of slides wanting to show in Toronto. Then he went back to Pakistan and now he's seen as, uh, you know, probably leading artist in Pakistan. But for us, it's also his connections here. So those like, I'm really interested in the, the story of all these threads, right? And how all these connections, uh, like I didn't end up in Pakistan randomly. It was because of the connection with Russia, Rana and Asma who's here, their connections to Pakistan allowed that project to flourish, right? And, and then even with Rung, um, I had sort of uh, limited experience with the wrong I had as an artist was, you know, in one of their issues, I would read it religiously. But again, it was a space, though, unlike uh, they in Toronto, it was a very active in the West Coast scene. So it allowed me to kind of learn about what was happening out there, because I didn't really, you know, it's a huge country. And a lot of this we're talking about pre internet. And so we would take these pages and like obsessively like you want to hold it because that's your contact right and then there were lists of like people you could contact right across the country if you know you were a young queer artist list of like all the you know queer communities and artistic communities on the west coast in india and it was it was amazing because that was like your uh phone book right as well and so now to kind of come back to the present um, you know, I feel like for me, those early years allowed me to build, and it, that was my interest too, this like international kind of network or hub of friends and colleagues, and that allowed them to come here. I went there and the conversation has been going kind of ongoing for 30 years, right? But then, uh, then reconnecting with the rung for rung, like rung has recently relaunched. I think in the last five, four or five years, uh, but it's now on a digital platform and it's no longer just a magazine. But what they're doing is I think really exciting because um, it's this idea that you have your West Coast hub, but the, the reach and their, the conversations they wanna do is global. And so they're very interested in the kind of things that were happening with Godzilla and pairing that with the kind of arts and activism happening in Vancouver. And they were already connected with Daesh. And so I think, and there have been multiple projects and I wanna, you know, highlight, you know, I think Alice Jim is back here and uh, Alice and um, I think also another colleague um, and we have, uh, sorry, Alex Chang is, uh, did like one of, uh, I think what it's called, basically creating, um, a mapping of like how this person's connected to this person through what group. And these kinds of mapping projects, I think are really important. And then you begin to see that reach. It's like, oh yeah, this person worked with this person on this project here, but wait, then they met this person and then they went and did that project, right? Like, so that kind of, um, kind of, it's like a global mapping, but of course you have these huge clusters in certain areas because of who was based in one area, right? So I'm loving that. I'm seeing that Rung is doing that kind of cluster mapping and Alex Chang was leading that. That's within the, for her project, it was more Asian American arts and activism kind of scene. It's a great project. I can share links later. Thank you. Hello. 
Okay. Um, well, hi, Shelly. Uh, thank you for this like amazingly rich presentation. Um, and I think like part of the richness of it was just how you contextualize your work. Um, you, well, your personal work has had so many mediums um, and so many forms and um, particularly the work that you had, which had like prints and overlays of your own um, drawings on it. Um, kind of engaging in a way of like a kind of archival work. So I think my question here is kind of, you know, right now you're here and you're able to present your work to us in its own context. Um, but how do you, you, you talked about, you know, infiltrating museum spaces. Is there kind of the same effort to infiltrate archival spaces and take control of how, you know, your work is gonna be archived when you might no longer be here to talk about it and how um, your work might be used and taken out of context one day, the same way that you had taken those prints out of their original context. Um, thank you. Yes, uh, it's a, uh, something I think about a lot. <laughs> and I think uh, more so, I would say in the past 10 years when I realized even work that didn't seem like it was that far back, like, um, when we're talking about the mid nineties, then it was like, wait, that's 20 years ago at that point. And there was a, a new generation of uh, people involved with that, of writing these South Asian and diasporic art histories uh, who really didn't have access to those materials. Though I feel like even at that like young age, I kind of had it. I had a real sense that it's important to have really good documentation it's for every show. We've got professional documentation, et cetera. Um, I didn't document enough people, right? That was, as I noted, I was really focused on documenting the art. Now I'm more focused also on documenting who was there because with the art, you don't get the whole story, right? And um, so, and, I am actually became became very distressed about the the lack of a cohesive archive of materials for researchers, for other artists, um, and uh, you know people who were art historians um, who that was their subject area who don't know these histories, right? And um, I felt that to some degree, if you don't know that history. And this is your specialty. And I was encountering a number of people with PhDs who had no idea about what SAVAK or Desh Pradesh or other organizations were doing. But I think there, there's been a bit of that shift because, uh, but again, it kind of falls back on us. And I'm like, part of me is you know, cynical. It's like, we did that work <laughs> earlier on. We want the next generation to like take that interest to help us kind of archive that. It's, it's um, kind of, it's always expected that we will do it. And there's a, you know, like, I, I feel like definitely I appreciate being able to share this story and it's there. And I think also having it um, documented on video and having that be accessible, I think is really important. Um, just last year, I believe it was, was the very first, I know there's uh, people who had participated for Desh Pradesh, there was a, a massive project, which was an oral archives project and a gathering of archives, archival materials. Uh, but it was uh, oral archives, which is also very important. But I think there's something when you actually see the people. I'm a visual person. I'm in the world of visual art. So I love at least having the Zoom conversations. But there was not one single panel about Desh Pradesh, this like, groundbreaking organization till last year, right? Till last year. This is like, I find that like really quite shocking. <laughs> um, and that there was no material for people to go to. And so that there was a conversation through a uh, real Asian film festival, but that video is not easily accessible. But I think it's a really important thing. And so I'm gonna request that this is uh, something that should be easily accessible for, for anybody. And it was it was great. I was fortunate to participate on it, but there were five people all who had different 
sort of uh, engagement with Desh Pradesh. But it's to me, it's very sad that it only happened, right? Despite the thousands of people that were involved in it, and this is a festival that, you know, from its early beginnings, we're talking about at least a 12 year history uh, of people coming in from around the world. Uh, there are great program books, so the program books still exist. Uh, but um, yeah, I'm just really realizing how easily, despite best efforts, things do get lost, right? And then you also had a second part to the question, what happens then, uh, next? And I like to think that, okay, I'm just one of the voices of this like much bigger thing. And I appreciate that even for Pradesh, Pradesh when they did the oral archives, they interviewed like, I don't know, maybe 30 people, right? And so I was one voice out of 30. There were many others, but at least there were 30 voices. And oftentimes those voices did contradict each other. We had different, and I think that that's okay, but that's a lot richer than just one person being a spokesperson for, for an institution, right? Um, so my hope is like for, for SAVAC, I've uh, been fortunate to be able to do, I think it's my second talk, the third talk about SAVAC that's at least available as a video recording, right? But um, I would hope other people who are involved also share their versions, their stories, and then that will create that richer archive, right? So this is just one voice. Um, I, maybe there's time for a tiny question, but otherwise we, we should wrap up. If there's one last question anyone wants to ask. Thank you so much for this talk and everyone's questions. I feel like as the talk went on, had a lot of questions that have been answered, and this is a quick one. Um, my name is Margaret. Um, I was wondering with the, the interactive installations, you had mentioned how a big part is to sort of have this kind of open-ended narrative in a way, or, or have the audience kind of fill the gaps. And I wondered if you ever think of, or if you've gathered any um, of, like audience feedback or uh, those ideas or stories that the audience is coming up with as they're experiencing the work, or if that's the point is not to maybe gather that or how maybe that comes into the archive too, thinking of archive again. Just to... Yeah, I, I, I wish I had more of that, right? I feel like sometimes, you know, traditional way where you might have like a guest book and people might write a few notes. Um, most of what I've gathered is like either people come up to me and tell me their experience, or I hear from when I'm gone, the, the gallery folks, right, will say, oh, this happened. Uh, but uh, one way I have uh, collected something which I, which I really love is uh, there was the project with uh, Peace Force Security. Um, and in that one at the booth, uh, when you come and it's kind of like, it doesn't say it's a border crossing, but it references that, you know, you have to um, provide a piece of ID. You have to um, also fill out a questionnaire, but the questionnaire asks you, um, you know, what do you uh, dream of when you sleep or, you know, other questions that are like a little bit um, silly or playful and allow for people to, uh, you know, it, you can have various readings based on how they're experiencing the work. Is how some people are very formal. I drink, you know, like this. Yeah. And um, yeah, one question was, uh, do you ever dance in the dark, right? So things, um, and so it's, it's interesting how people would respond. So I have a, a nice collection of those. But yes, I think more so I would love to kind of gather those in some way. I haven't quite thought of that how yet but I do really cherish that, those boxes of feedback. Yeah. All right, so if we could give one last round of applause for Shelley Ball.
Can I just also say thank you so much to all my friends and colleagues who brought me out here. And it was really, I think it was important to me and thank you, especially Alice and Barbara and Javier. Um, yeah, it was important for me to be here in person. I think that's another thing I want to, well, you know, we debated, should we do Zoom, should we do this? And I think that there's something uh, in, when I think about my, some of the people who were my mentors or people who I was inspired by, it's about when I like finally either met them or I had an experience with their work. There's something about that, that personal connection. And uh, despite how much I, you know, love and hate Zoom, I think that there's something to be said about being in community and in communion. Like this is, I think of like art gatherings, this is my church, mm -hmm. right? This is my, you know, if we think these are sacred spaces, whether we're here in the academy, it's kind of very, you know, it's a nice formal academic room, but this is like, for me, these are my moments of communion mm -hmm. and I appreciate them. And I appreciate all of you being here with me. So thank you. You get shown. Right. Okay, everyone. Thank you again for coming into Force Space for this conversation. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Bobir. Uh, we'll be closing up the Zoom and the live stream now, but just a quick reminder that this conversation is already available. <clears throat> excuse me, on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to revisit or share it. Uh, if you want to stick around, we have another event happening at four o'clock, looking very deeply into new tools uh, been created around open access as part of open access week. But in any case, please have a wonderful weekend and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>